All right, welcome to the first talk of this afternoon on the second day, UGM 2021. This is Jason Kaposky with the IROD's Consortium. He's going to talk about similar thing he talked about last year, IROD's policy composition, but, but now it's real. Go for it, Jason. All right, thank you. Yes, so this is uh, a side project I've been working on for a little bit. Uh, in order to frame this, we're going to talk about data management. And as you can see highlighted here, the goal is, is to capture these policies and practices and how we can use those to future proof, build a future proof solution for managing your data. Now, when we talk about policy, uh, one of my favorite words, uh, we have a set of ideas or a plan and what to do in a particular situation. So we start talking at a higher level about a, a what and then a when. So once we get you know, a group of people around the table in order to you know, make some decisions, how are we going to capture that and effect effectively reflect that in you know, real world computer actionable code? So a plan of what to do in those particular situations. Now, when we talk about policies, this can mean something very broadly, um, but typically when IRODS is used to implement these policies, we talk about something very specific related to that data. So that could be moving the data, making sure the data is safe and correct at rest, having a sufficient number of replicas, having a sufficient number of replicas on a sufficient number of resources in very specific locations. You may wanna have two on-prem and one off-prem for instance. So how can we guarantee that is actually in fact correct? Uh, we could talk about the data placement. Is that data routed to the correct resources for the appropriate purposes and so on and so forth. So there's this vast array of policy out there that we can implement and is implemented by you know, a number of people all around the world all the time. So the goal of policy composition here is a philosophy that I've been putting together that is going to help us move up this stack. So our ROTS has four core competencies, as you've heard us say many times, effectively the underlying technology of our ROTS itself. And above that, we talk about the policy layer. So we use the technology in order to implement the policy now, the question that I had, you know, posed to myself is, is how do we get from these policies to these capabilities and what does that even mean? So some questions we wanted to answer is how can we help new users get started? Someone installs IRODs and, and then what? You have to go read through 100,000 IROD chat messages to figure out what you can do with this thing. So how do we make all of this effort reusable? So we want to be able to take something off the shelf and plug it in and watch it go? And how can we simplify this policy development? So how do we make getting from here to there easier for new users? And once we have all of these other nice things, how can we put together a cookbook of deployments, which will help us or help you know, us as a community, if you will, get started and you know, have some standard practices around how these things are implemented? And using all of this, can we really get from this concept of policy to this concept of capabilities? So what I would like to do is consider policy as a building blocks, not necessarily Legos, but as close as we can make them in order you can plug them, plug them in together, which would follow you know, proven software engineering principles, favor composition over monolithic implementations. So we can use the rules and dynamic policy enforcement point behavior to overload and fall through. And we can begin by implementing, configuring several rule bases and rule engine plugins to achieve a much more complex set of use cases rather than having to write one monolithic policy, policy implementation. So in the original approach, you know, back in the good old days, we have our favorite AC post proc for put, and then we have just a significant amount of if lettered code in here where we have all of these different um, use cases and you can end up with pages and pages of this in um, core.re, and this becomes untenable from a maintenance point of view. So the first thing that we wanted to do was decompose this into individual practices where we could expand that policy implementation across a number of different rule bases. So we start taking these things apart. So metadata extraction and application, asynchronous replication, indexing, access time, all of these different policies can be taken from a monolithic implementation and moved over to these individual implementations. So we have metadata.re, checksum.re, access time.re, which are each implementing their own policy enforcement points. But the key takeaway here is, is we have a, not necessarily a new um, capability within the rule engine plugin framework, which allows us to continue through different rule implementations to just simply indicate to the system that I have done work, it is okay, just keep trying hard. <clears throat> 
And so this gets us to a closer you know, implementation of what we want, where we can start putting together these different rule bases in order to achieve those outcomes. Now, once we've gotten that far, the question is, is how can we take all of these different policies and consider composing them into new capabilities? So my favorite example of storage tiering here is a, is a collection of policies where we can take a look at it at a high level and say, well, storage tiering requires us to react to access time. And then effectively, we need to identify violating data objects and then replicate that data from one tier to the next, verify that it's correct at rest, and then to decide whether or not we're going to remove the data from the original tier. So this is how we've been implementing data movement for storage tiering. But can we take those apart? And the answer was uh, yes, and I believe it was in Utrecht where we started talking about this, where policies can be composed into these monolithic framework plugins where we can start delegating each step of that policy out to an individual implementation. So the access time, data movement, replication, verification, and retention are all individual policies within the, the framework that are invoked individually. And any user can implement any of these in any way they like. And now while that, that, that is great, that's not necessarily composing anything because we still have all of that uh, policy implemented in this one monolithic framework. So we started asking ourselves, can we take the framework apart and somehow generalize the framework in a way that can be reusable and not necessarily uh, have each individual implementation for indexing and storage tiering and publication and so on and so on. So we can write simple policy implementations that aren't necessarily tied to any policy enforcement point, which are currently baked into the frameworks. They do their one thing well, and how it gets invoked is completely irrelevant. So the policy implementer shouldn't care how that policy is invoked or when it's invoked or why it's invoked. It should just do that one thing well. And that gets us to the point where we can start reusing these things. So we start with the when. This is where we start taking the framework apart and putting it into individual reusable pieces. So, you know, as a policy implementer, we have about, you know, 11 million different policy enforcement points that you may need to know something about if you want to capture every possible edge case on how data gets through IRODs or metadata is manipulated and so on and so forth. So we came up with this concept known as event handlers that wrap all of the policy enforcement points around each noun within the system, say collections or data objects and so on, and then just distill all of these policy enforcement points down into a simple event that lets the policy know, or actually the person who's configuring the policy know what happened. So if you take um, put or write, for instance, you can open, close, and write. You can call the put API. You can have a bulk put. Um, and I think there's uh, the five move and there's like five different ways data can flow through the system. We've distilled all of that down into event handler for data objects, which allow you to simply use one of these events here in order to configure your policy. So the data objects, collections, metadata, users, all of the nouns have their own class of event handler uh, where policy is invoked based on its configuration. So data object modified has a list of events here. And as I said earlier, well, the key takeaway is, is that this unifies all of the data movement down into a simple framework so you can configure that policy. So this is a rule engine plugin. It is configured just like a rule engine plugin has been configured. And you can see this is the data object modified event handler. And then you can just simply configure policy here in order to have that policy invoked. So, we have active policy clauses, which are pre, post, uh, except, and finally. We have the events around which this policy is going to be invoked. And then we just say, this is the name of the policy to invoke. This policy could be written in the Python rule engine plugin, the native rule engine plugin, or another, or, or another uh, individual policy engine itself. It doesn't matter because the rule engine plugin framework normalizes all that behavior. So now we have the when, we can get to the what. These are simple policy implementations that follow a standardized interface that allow you to have these policies invoked through this framework. And the, the idea here is, is that we as a community can grow a cookbook around these things and uh, you know, a whole uh, class of implementations that are eminently reusable and supportable by the consortium. So as I said, you can implement these in the native rule engine plugin, you can implement these in the Python rule engine plugin, or as I call them, light C++ rule engine um, 
plugins, which I call policy engines, which most of the examples that we have here are implemented as such. So policy can be invoked in one of three different conventions. So as you know, the policy can be driven through um, a direct invocation. So I'm just gonna run this with iRule. Uh, they can be invoked via query. So a query processor is another um, a policy engine that allows you to implement queries and then pass that data along as parameters or as one of those event handlers. And each of these have their own contracts around how these interfaces um, are managed. So from a direct invocation, as you can see, we can just invoke policy access time and we pass the parameters of, as that as a, J, as a JSON string, or you can configure these statically. Now this is all effectively what you would expect to see in server config down here at the bottom. And this is just simply I rule at the top. The query processor can do the same thing. So we can in, um, configure a query processor to run, and that's going to once again be uh, configured to run by I rule. It takes a parameters JSON object, just as we've seen before, that takes the query string, we give it a limit and the other parameters here, and then just run our um, policy with this. Now, for, the, for example here, you can see in order username, call name, data name, and rest name are going to be passed directly to this policy engine example as a JSON array. So this is the contract between query processor and one of these um, policy implementations. And it would look something like this. So where we have username, call name, data name, and then the rest name. Uh, I'm gonna skip over that because we don't have as much time. Configuration is anything that you need to statically pass to the, the policy. So parameters are typically dynamically generated. Configuration is something that you as a user is gonna pass in because you may want to use a different attribute for your access time, for instance. That would be a piece of configuration. And then there's the why. So we have policy conditionals wrapped around these uh, things as well for every one of these nouns, which are effectively a regular expression that can be matched that indicate whether one of these things need to be run or not. So we have a little bit of, you know, a domain specific language, if you can consider uh, hidden in here, where we basically say, run this policy if these conditionals match. Now, all of the conditionals in here are effectively anded together if you need to have a more complex environment. And if you need or like behavior, you would just configure another set of policy to be invoked in the uh, JSON array here, which effectively gives you the or behavior. Another example, which is quite typical, is, is metadata existing. So data object modified on a put, post, put, or write. If the indexing tag exists on a particular collection, then we run the Elasticsearch indexing um, policy, for instance. You know, once again, all of this is effectively just configuration within server config. Now, how we have the ability to enqueue a rule and execute a rule. So these are... Um, gives us the ability to uh, reach into the asynchronous uh, behavior of IRONs. All of these policy, these two policies, I'm sorry, are going to be or are supported by 428 and 429 in the C++ default rule engine plugin. So this gives us the ability to remove Python, remove any interpreter from the system and run everything at C++ speed if uh, that is the uh, way we want to have our deployment configured. And so if we're going to set up an, execu uh, an asynchronous execution, we're going to call the policy um, NQ rule. We're going to give it some delay conditions here. Then we're going to say, once this rule is going to be fired, we're going to execute a rule and we're going to trip our file system usage um, policy engine, for instance. And that source resource that it's going to look at is going to be demo risk. So this could be either delayed execution or direct invocation. And it's a, basically an example of both all roll up into one. So the new approach, so the when is which policy enforcement points, the, well, let's skip over that slide and get right into some examples here. Um, let's see. So this is an implementation of synchronous access time. So on a post, anything that involves touching the data, um, we're going to update the access time. Um, and that policy is not taking any configuration here. And this is for the data object modified event handler. Um, replication. So this is a very typical use case. So synchronous replication. On a post create writer registration, we're going to call the data replication policy, which uses a source to destination resource map. So if data lands on source zero, we're going to replicate it to destination resource zero A and zero B. 
If data lands on resource one, we're going to um, replicate that to destination resource 1A. Um, you know, and we can do the same thing down here. Um, so like I said, you can have as many of these configured as you like, even using the same policy in order to attain that or-like behavior I mentioned earlier. Asynchronous replication looks exactly the same. On the inside, we're just wrapping it in, um, with an execute rule and an enqueue rule. So if anyone touches the data, we're going to schedule or enqueue a data replication job. So same as before, just simply asynchronous. Uh, for synchronous retention, so um, on a post replication, for instance, we're going to trim a single replica um, from either resource one or resource two. And this is the uh, resource list for the allowable resources for which that data is allowed to be trimmed. And so this, you can see how we can start combining things like replication and data retention together and compose them into something that might look like storage tiering. Uh, we can do the same thing with a query. So we're just going to find all of the data objects that happen to match this collection name, uh, where the resource name is resource one or two. All of that information is going to get passed in order to the data retention policy. And we're going to trim data that is only on resource one or resource two. And we can do the same thing for verification. So post create writer uh, registration, we can verify that a data object is correct at rest. And we can do the same thing with asynchronous if you want to implement something like, say, fixity checking, for example. And keep in mind the verification um, policy actually is driven by metadata using the flavor of that verification, which could be catalog, file system, or checksum, depending on how um, safe you want to make sure your data happens to be. So I'm going to skip over the storage sharing example because it is a little deep and we're running out of time here. Um, but let's take a look at the, uh, did I miss it? Hmm. I thought I had the uh, DTN slides in here too, but I guess I don't. So I'll go back and talk about the, um, the uh, storage sharing here. So we're driving this with a query processor, which is going to find all of the resources that happen to be uh, in a tiering group. If you blur your eyes a little bit, basically we're going to make sure metadata exists. And then from there, we're going to you know, find all of the data objects and effectively invoke data replication. The uh, more interesting part of this is, is that the uh, for the synchronous part, we have the access time, we have uh, the data restage, and we have the um, data verification and then the data retention. So you'll see here that this is a post replication. Policy from the previous slide is invoking this replication policy because the um, implementations are designed to go back through the rule engine plugin framework. So Policy that is configured in, in policy composition can trigger other policy in policy composition, which gives us the ability to glue all of these things together. Now, one thing that um, made me really happy is, is that we have the ability to add additional features just simply with different configurations. So an open issue in the storage tiering um, repository was, hey, give us the ability to restage data using metadata. So using the meta metadata modified event handler, if the attribute happens to look like this and the value is could be anything, uh, invoke the restage policy. So a little bit of additional configuration gets us that new feature without having to touch and understand everything that you need to know about the uh, monolithic framework plugin. And ultimately, you know, this is where we want to get back to the you know, data management model where we can start putting some of these things together and gathering those requirements from the uh, field and from the community in order to you know, boil it down to the individual pieces of policy that we need so we can put this all together. And hopefully, and hopefully maybe by the you know, end of the year or end of next year, we'll have a user interface that'll allow us to simply discover policy configured in a server um, you know, through the zone report and then effectively give us a visual programming language to plug all of these things together. And that should be it. All right. Time for Q&A? Yes. 1.30 on the dot. Nailed it. That's right. We do have uh, one hand up from, uh, okay. from Janos. Janos, can you hear me? 
Hello, yes. There you are. Go for it. <laughs> the best of questions. Do you have a question for Jason? No. Ah. No. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, yes, I don't know that anyone had a chance to breathe and ask you questions. Uh, so for the most part, this is now implemented and about ready. We've not released it. This uh, is implemented. We have uh, proofs of concept deployed in the field, you know, using this approach. And, you know, from there, you know, we just need to get it through CI. And, um, you know, basically it is just about 30 different individual packages uh, each for, you know, the event handler and all of the different policy engines. That's right. And so this would allow us to uh, release a more, well, not even more flexible, just a different implementation of the storage tiering, which is currently, you know, all compiled in and we consider it the unified. Uh, but yes. then the yeah. other things, uh, the, the other things that we have not quite released, the, the publishing capabilities, the, some of the other things, uh, this can now just cover all of those. The yeah, part. I mean, the, the, the interesting part to me was is that when I put the whole concept together and then started applying it to the other capabilities, like for instance, the implementation for Elasticsearch is about now 40 lines of code because yeah. we're really only interested in the business logic around interacting with Elastic. We didn't have to build the whole framework in order to actually build that one piece that was interesting. Right. And right. same is true for publications. So we can write a policy engine for publishing the Dataverse. We can write a policy engine, you know, to, for publishing the NCBI. And all of the other stuff is eminently reusable and factored out of the business logic of how that works. Right. And uh, we've got a Tony Edgen question about will this be available for 429? Uh, and where can I find the documentation? <laughs> uh, it is it is all within the uh, IRODS namespace. The IRODS uh, rule engine plugins policy is the name of the repository, I believe. And there's you know like a giant readme that it describes how all of these different pieces work. Right. So we can get a link to that. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll scare up a link and drop it in Slack. Okay. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Alan King has a question for you. Oh, he should know everything already. Well, I was going to say, this is like my third time hearing this talk probably, but um, <laughs> my question uh, had to do with uh, the contract between the framework and the policy engines. Yes. So if you were to say, uh, need a new policy engine, which does not yet exist, you'd have to update both the framework to recognize the policy engine by name and- No. No, no. So if the um, I don't want to take too much time, but if I can oh. just blur my eyes and find the slide with the policy implementations, the contract is actually um, I feel like I'm getting close. OK, so the contract is just simply these two stringified parameters, which are parameters and configuration. Now, if we go forward a little bit, query has a contract of, I send you a JSON array of things. Um, the event handlers just bundle everything up into potentially big, scary stuff. And then the policy just needs to know what it needs to know in order to get it out of that big bundle of scary stuff. So if you have a new policy that doesn't exist yet, it's going to need to react to one of the event handlers or the query engine or one of those things. That passes all the nouns around within the system. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, I was thinking of them as being upstream from the event handlers, but they're actually downstream from that. Yeah, the, 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 the contract is, is that I have a policy name that could be named anything and I take two strings. Now, how they're invoked via the, or I guess, you know, yeah, how they're invoked via the event handlers or the query engine or whatever, um, just, Get the rule engine plugin framework um, to invoke that policy once again. Right. Cool. Thanks. Certainly. And this execute rule here just simply takes these two things, turns them into strings, and passes them to this policy through the rule engine plugin framework. You know, like any other policy would be invoked. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.